we begin. So we're going to do our second class on Orwell's 1984. Uh, I've decided to use this image behind me rather than the one of the all-seeing eye, which is sort of interesting as well, that they've used for the book that I've assigned here, which is a little bit more like Sauron's eye. And um, I think that's intentional on the part of the uh, those that constructed that image for this uh, novel, because that idea of being observed through technology and uh, the use of technology to gain power, uh, which I spoke about last time in connection with the abolition of man, is one of the concerns for Orwell here. Um, it did strike me that the, the three slogans of the uh, Oceania, um, wars, peace, freedom of slavery, ignorance of strength, might, uh, he might have derived some of this from a poem by an 18th century poet by the name of Thomas Gray, Ode on a Distant Prospect of Eton College, where, remember, Orwell went to study and Huxley, uh, at which Huxley taught the, as I say, the foremost private school in Britain, which makes it a public school. We, we dissociate those two, see them as opposites. The most private school in Britain is actually uh, the public schools because they intend those who go to them to serve in public service. But the ode concludes with these lines. I won't read the whole ode. To each his sufferings, all are men, condemned alike to groan, the tender for another's pain, the unfeeling for his own. Yet, ah, why should they know their fate, since sorrow never comes too late, and happiness too swiftly flies? Thought would destroy their paradise, no more, where ignorance is bliss, tis folly to be wise. Um, it seems to me that uh, the at least the third of the three slogans here, that ignorance uh, is what? Is it literally ignorance is bliss? Ignorance is strength. Ignorance is strength. Is, uh, yes, is still riffing on this. And because I am quite certain that George Orwell would have read uh, this poem by Thomas Gray, it's a famous poem. And the lines at the conclusion are famous, and they will be themselves referring back to Ecclesiastes, where it talks about the weight of experience being vanity. You know, the Cle Ecclesiastes, all is vanity, hevel, a puff of wind. Uh, all the knowledge, and, and it's just a, a form of uh, all the accumulated knowledge does nothing but weigh on the soul and doesn't bring you forward as well. So that meditation which we uh, find from Ecclesiastes. And here in 1984, where Big Brother is watching you, there are these three slogans. War is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. Which are contradictory and, and yet are the mottos of this new world order in which they live and we concluded the uh, first chapter of book or of book one with a knock at the door when uh, Winston Smith is trying to hide in the corner and write in his diary here's a knock at the door obviously makes us immediately anxious nervous and and the the whole of the, the novel is like that, I find. That there's a, an intense sense through, and this is part of the um, technical brilliance of the story, more so than Huxley, I think. He creates a sense of uh, terror in the reader. He conveys that, not just in uh, Winston Smith, who we find ourselves connected to in a sense, in the sense that we feel always on the side of the underdog against a great machine, we are uh, tender for another's pain. And in this case, Winston Smith, we can imagine ourselves in that same situation, 
not liking the conformity either, let alone the constant surveillance and the dehumanizing um, sense of being watched at all times for the greater good of all. And it's much like this uh, place that's built in the uh, this prison made in Cuba, which you will have seen in, I think, one of the Marvel superhero movie, movies, based on the idea of the greatest possible good for the greatest number of people, and, will, and, and he calls it a pan-opticon, uh, uh, in which the prison guard is at the center of the tower and all the prisoners are living in wallless prison cells in which the uh, prison warden can look in on them at every point. They're always being observed. And it's a circular prison. And as I say, there's no privacy. You have this, the, the, the sense, although though, uh, Winston Smith, like everybody in this world, has their own habitations, they are, are always in the public square. The private sphere has been invaded by the public square in order that things like the family, which is the governing institution of all society, historically speaking, no longer will govern, and that big brother might control the future. So it's totalizing in that sense. It will control reproduction. The same way we saw in Huxley's Brave New World, they did through hatching and removing reproduction from the act of intercourse and putting it into a laboratory to control the, and, and even so far as controlling the outcomes, neonatal conditionings and all that. Here we have it in a very different sense, not in a biotechnical way, but rather through surveillance technology. So that the screens that are on, on the pretty much everywhere, it's very difficult to be out of the gaze of a screen and it also has the capacity to listen in on your conversations, um, gives us a sense of oppression and a lack of privacy and a lack and, a, and an invasion in a, what we, we often call personal space. He has no personal space. He feels like he's being suffocated by being incapable of being on his own. There's no solitude. And you don't really feel the oppression of a lack of solitude until you don't have any, at which point you, you really long for it. You get it when you sleep. When you sleep, you're um, withdrawn from the world. You can recover your strength. You can rehabilitate and regenerate yourself. You're not always externally focused. Here, even when you're on your own and not wanting to attend to the world around you, you are always being watched. And this is an oppressive thing. And that he does try and present it, even though it's in a, in a building, as being very much like being in a prison cell. And the jailers are not beneficent jailers. Unlike the model uh, was intended, it was based on the panopticon design of uh, panopticon, uh, a, a term that's used by, uh, let me see here and it'll come to it. Jeremy Bentham. You can see this here, used for British prison cells in which they could maximize the greatest possible good for the greatest number of people and to heck with the individual. It's pragmatism. It, it drives it. There's a dehumanization inherent in the whole, considering the, number, the greatest number of people, the greatest good offered for the greatest number of people at the expense of the individual is of the essence of tyranny. The Christian view is that the, an individual soul of it is of inestimable worth. You have nothing more precious to you than your soul. What doth it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul, says Jesus. That's the Western tradition. The Western tradition, uh, both biblical and classical, will value the individual life and see it as something that ought to be defended at all costs. It will distinguish the Greeks from the barbarians. They're not saying that people who are barbarians aren't humans. 
it, they're saying that barbarians don't value the individual. They're willing to th send them in huge numbers to win a war, and they're not really defending anything. They just want victory at all costs. In the uh, Greek tradition, it's the individual and the polis that allows for freedom that is being fought for. They're fighting for freedom, not just freedom for their city, but freedom for the people that reside within the city. That gets passed on in, in Christian thought and given a greater strength because it's not only the, the men with property who have that individual worth and dignity, it's every person because every person bears the image and likeness of God. Male, female, slave, child, elderly, infirm, whatever. Every person has a, a human dignity. The Presidio Mondello, based on this idea of a panopticon, is there for practical purposes, for, the, for efficiency, if you will. Remember I talked about efficiency being the mark that distinguishes our world from uh, civilizations past. And in uh, that novel, Heart of Darkness, they say that's what makes us superior to those in the past. It's efficiency, our commitment to efficiency. But efficiency cares nothing about individuals. Individuals are, are, are a speed bump on the road to building a more efficient society. If you're going to regard a human being as part of a population group or a species or a nation and you don't think that the individual matters, then you will be willing to sacrifice individuals and you will not consider ethics in the process either. And that's what we see in 1984, that individual human life is of no value whatsoever. They're in an, a panopticon, as it were, even though they're in a building all over the place. They're constantly being watched and they're being watched to the point of their, their gestures. Not just what they say, not just what they write, but if their face betrays an emotion that contradicts what they're expected to betray in relation to the stimulus presented. So in the little one minute of hate, they better act like they hate. So they'll act in a frenzied mob and rage at the picture of Goldstein on the screen because of course he's a criminal, so kill him, kill him. They'll all explode into a frenzy and act on cue. And if they don't do that, or if they're a little less enthusiastic than they ought to be, that will be seen. And they will be sought out and found, and they'll have to go undergo rehab. And rehabilitation means torture and reprogramming. Probably killing, but if not, at least reprogramming for thought crime. Because the thought contradicts how you're conditioned to behave. Remember I said this is about freedom and versus conditioning. It's a type. It, this is a futuristic novel, but I think it's con like all dystopian uh, sci-fi type novels. It's not sci-fi, but futuristic dystopian novels. It's actually uh, present commentary. That's its purpose. It's, a, it's supposed to be about now. It's not about the future. It's about a, a, a present that we can imagine being worse than it is now on the basis of the already established tendencies which are accepted in the society all around us. So when Orwell writes this in 1949, six years after C.S. Lewis writes The Abolition of Man, they are concerned with the same process of conditioning and where it inevitably leads, which is that some who have power will exercise that power over some others who they now will not hold to be of the same human standards as themselves and will do whatever they want with them because they don't have anything in common with those. They don't share a common human nature, a common human nature which have been, would have been seen if they appealed to their moral nature, but they don't recognize morality. It's a subjective thing. That's where I was last time. Did it make sense last time when I talked about this? It's rather s sweeping, and I've moved away from commentary on the, the plot, per se, and the characters in it to talk just about the general trajectory of what 1984 is revealing about the use of technology for the sake of allegedly adva of advancing society 
uh, which could appear like a carrot the way it does in Huxley's world, or it could appear like a stick as it does in 1984, and effectively it's means to the same end. In both cases, they don't recognize morality, they don't recognize the legitimacy of the individual, and they don't recognize the family. In fact, they see them as obstacles, and both of them are keen to eradicate history. They have their own constructed world that they control, and they don't want anything that contradicts that world. So in, in, in the, the case of Huxley, those that are barbarians live outside the city. And they're left to live like, and they can read Shakespeare if they want, but people in the city are given Soma and are hatched and conditioned early or very early on, and they are taught to love what they do and not imagine or want to do anything else. And the majority of the people are very happy with that. And we meet a few individual, individuals who are dissatisfied with it, just as it appears that Huxley is. He thinks it's a, it's a nightmare scenario, but he can imagine us uh, the vast majority of human beings being very happy to live in a brave new world. Very happy. And he's terrified at that prospect. Orwell sees it coming down uh, in a far more what we would call authoritarian manner, in a far more vicious uh, and sadistic manner. Which is more realistic? I think both are equally realistic, actually. And they can be combined, for that matter, and without contradiction. So in Canada, we lived in Huxley's brave new world up until recent times. And now it looks more 1984-ish. But, but sex with whatever you want, with whomever you want, how many times, with as many people, in whatever conditions, whatever situation, we mustn't judge. Right? We can do abortion, we can do euthanasia, we can do all of that sort of stuff. That's just progress. You don't want to go back to the days, dot, dot, dot. That was the inducement of the delights that you get from this, with some pushback if you dare question the status quo. But by and large, it was done through the carrot. Now I think we can see the stick come out. You have a comment or question over there? I'm sorry, I saw it. Because um, from the last class, yes. um, I've, I've, I've kind of been struggling with reconciling the concept. Yep. Like, and you mentioned Ecclesiastes, and it's funny because in the context of Ecclesiastes 8.1, when we really spoke about um, the concept of punishment, so the carrot uh, in the last analogy where, you know, the carrot or the stick, and then in the context of Ecclesiastes 8.11, where the sentence for crime is not to be carried out, Yep. Right. So in that context and based on Huxley and Orwell and and you, you look at it in the lens of now, I'm like, how how, how do we reconcile how do we reconcile those thoughts? Like I mean, if we say, for example, that um, so with reference to the person, if the person has no value, then how do we justify all of this emphasis on the rights of the person in the modern day context against the rights of the person who was wrong. Well, what do we mean by right and wrong? So, uh, so like, let's look at it in the context of prison, for example. Yes. Somebody's in prison because they committed some illegal act. Right. Right? Yep. So we have and are we assuming they deserved to be in the prison or they've just been put there? It does, and sometimes they ought not to be there, but, uh, is it but, but you don't care about that. But for the, the, for, for the purpose of this argument is that, so let us pretend we have a murderer in prison. Yes, a murderer, okay. And one of the things, a convicted murderer in prison, and you have the discussion around the rights of the human rights of that convicted murderer in prison. Yes. But then we seem to dismiss the rights of the victim. So yes. So on the one hand, on the one hand No, we don't. We see, we see that the perpetrator has rights, but the victims don't. Right. 
And there is a way of rectifying that, which is to place a value in accordance with the value on the person upon whom the crime has been committed. So, for example, the value of a human life will be correspondent to the punishment that you accord to the crime committed against them. So if I take first degree murder, I kill somebody in cold blood and, and set out to do it and then do it, if the punishment for that is prison for a year, then that's the value of a human life. You lose a year's freedom. That's the value, that's how, we, how important we value a, a life of a person, right? That's, that's, that's the merit, that's the measure for it, right? Because that's the sentence. The sentence is you're gonna be in prison for a year, and they might say 10, but then good behavior, you get out in two or whatever, it, I don't care. It's just for the sake of argument anyway. But that what you've then said is that human life, if you take one deliberately, you're going to lose two years of total freedom, but then you will get out and be restored to your situation. What does that say about the value of the person whose life was taken? So it says that the, the, that person's life has been as much as valuable. Correct. So which is, which is the, the point though, because you're right. we don't see equal application of the concept. And Correct. That's, I, that that's why I'm struggling with this, because on the one hand, we are saying that um, we don't consider the value of a person, but then on the other hand, we are. Well, no. Yeah, so I, I see your dilemma. Which is that we see the value of the person who is the criminal, but we don't see the value of the person who is the victim. So we're being contradictory. The contradiction is worse than you're presenting it, because we are seeing a criminal as, in some sense, being the primary victim of the crime, which is why we let the person off with a lesser sentence, because we think that there's a reason that must have motivated the person to do this atrocious act. And because of the, that reason, we're not gonna punish the person in accordance with the value of what they've done against the person whose life they took, which would be if you kill somebody, first degree premeditated murder, then it's, a, it's Capital offense. Same for a rape. In, in scripture, it's, it's, it is the eye for the eye. If you've taken somebody's life on purpose, set out to do it, it's a capital offense. After a, 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 you know, a, a process of judicial process to assure that you actually did it. But it is a capital offense, first degree murder. In the Western penitentiary system as it develops, a a, there's a hermeneutic that goes along with this that is at odds with the, exactly that and will say that the reason why people commit crimes is because of society. Society made this person into the person he is. The fundamental premise behind this is that people are, are in their natures good until they get corrupted and what corrupts them, well, if they're fundamentally good in themselves, how do they become corrupt? Society corrupts them. So if somebody commits a murder, it's because they themselves have been treated badly and it led them to do this act. But of, in and of themselves, they wouldn't do this because they're basically a good person because we're all basically good persons. So in other words, bad theology underlies the current criminal justice system. We don't see people as sinners. The word sin is never used in the criminal justice system. We, don't, we also don't hold the idea that people bear the image of God, and I include criminals under that. And so we'll throw people in prison for a first-degree murder alongside people who had a little bit too much marijuana in their backpack. They both go to prison, the penitentiary system. Where's the justice in that? Or didn't pay their alimony or whatever. You can, you can end up in the prison for things that deserve a, a severe punishment as well as those that seem rather trivial. Or if you commit an offense in the Online Harms Act, which is currently being floated by the Trudeau government, you can spend a life in prison because of an online harm, whatever that means. And it's so broad, the definition is so broad you can drive, drive a truck through it. But you life in prison for an online harm. 
I don't even know how they will judge the online harm, but, but you can spend a life in prison. But that's, that's currently on the books. It's right in Parliament being discussed. The intention is for Parliament to pass it. And I suspect it will get passed for perpetuating an online harm which, in which nobody will die, presumably. Although they might say because of your video, because of what somebody else saw there, they, they say because they watched your video, they decided that they should go out and kill person X. And so it's your fault because, of course, people who commit the acts are basically good and they wouldn't do a bad act unless society had corrupted them into it. But it, you can see the significance of theology in all this. The Romantics believed that people were fundamentally good. By nature, good. Because nature is always good. We're part of nature. And, but a fall comes about. How does the fall come about? Through socialization, through civilization, through negligent treatment, whatever. And then people become bad. And they become bad just simply by virtue of becoming older. Right? That's, that, but that's how people become corrupt. They're not in of themselves sinners. They become sinful by, um, by living, but they're not in their natures sinful or corrupt. They become corrupt. And if that is the case, then they can, it, there is a possibility of avoiding corruption. This is the romantic carrot. So I used to put it this way, and I don't think I put it in the class, and now I will do it. Which is it? Sounds like a chicken egg. It's not. Is there a difference between them? Are we sinners because we sin, or do we sin because we're sinners? The Arian heresy said that Jesus was God. Athanasius said Jesus is God. Both of them said it. So, but Athanasius accused Arius of heresy. What's the difference between the two? Nothing. So Athanasius says to Arius, okay, no, Jesus is the son of God. Both men say Jesus is the son of God and say, yes, but I know you mean something different by it than I mean by it. So how do, I, how do I flush you out so that we can see that you and I are talking about very different things? We, we see Jesus very differently. Athanasius flips around and says, okay, but will you say that Jesus is God the Son? And he says, no, I will not say that. So when Arius says that Jesus is the Son of God, he doesn't mean that he's God the Son. There now you have the bright, clear water between the two men. That's why it's flipped by what we say with God the Father, God the, the Son, God the Holy Spirit. If you do it the other way around, you could mean that God, it's, Jesus is the Son of God in some other sense. But whereas if, if you invert it, it's unambiguous. You mean that Jesus is God. He is divine in the sen same sense that the Father is and the Holy Spirit is. The three persons of the Trinity are, are God. When Arius says it, he means that he's the son in some way, by adoption, by the way in which he pleases God through his actions, uh, but, but he's not God. He's in some sense less God than the Father is. So there we go. You're denying the divinity of God the Son. That's what you're doing, Arius. Yes. Same thing happens here. Are we sinners because we sin, or are we, do we sin because we are sinners? Everything hangs on your answer here. <laughs> the Romantics will be very happily, happy to say the first. We are sinners because we sin. Well, of course, everyone who sins is a sinner. 
but it leaves the possibility that we could avoid sinning and then we wouldn't be a sinner, which would deny then original sin. Because original sin, the doctrine of original sin is that everybody who is born after Adam inherits original sin. We have, and we can't avoid it, we sin. Everyone who is a person is a sinner, right? So number two is correct. Number one sounds just like it, but number one opens the possibility which the romantics drive a truck through and say, yes, but we, because we're basically good, we can avoid sinning, but we admit that we don't. But the reason we don't is because society makes us sin. So we just need to go back to nature and get away from society, and then we can be the good people that we actually fundamentally are. And then they construct utopian schemes to make that happen, which never work. A prison, now that you mentioned it, this panopticon, what were they called in the 19th century? What was the whole system called? You know the phrase. Penitentiary system. What do you do when you're penitent? Why do you put people in prison? It's not, it's not a biblical punishment to stick somebody in prison. What, what's the purpose of it? It's a, it's a late invention, the, the modern prison cell. The panopticon is just a more elaborate version. It's to put you in there so you think about what you did and then you come out a better person. You're going to repent. You're going to be penitent. You're going to come out. You've been deprived. You've had a little bit of time to cool down and you come out and now you're ready to be restored and you've done your sentence, even though the sentence is not just in, in accordance with the crime committed, but still you go in and then you come out better. The criminal justice system right now, the rate of recidivism, repeat offense, is 90%, right? Repeat, like, so the, if it's a penitentiary system and the purpose is to make people rehabilitate, then it's a spectacular failure. It's an even bigger failure than that, however, because a prison cell takes, I, I mean, my data is out, is out of, um, is certainly out of uh, whack with the reality of now, but let's say 20 years ago, I heard that it took $100,000 to build a prison cell. And that takes $100,000 to keep somebody in a maximum security prison cell for a year. And the rate of recidivism is 90%. So considering the cost of creating the prison cell and the cost of maintaining the prisoner in the prison cell and the fact that it doesn't actually rehabilitate the prisoner and they usually end up coming out worse than they were than when they went in in terms of their behavior, question is, why would you ever put somebody in prison? So on the left, uh, the compassionate side that sees the goodness in everybody, they'll say, don't put them in prison at all and don't have police. Defund the police, we don't need the police at all. All they do is perpetuate this problem because we just need to tr understand the root causes of crime and if we eradicate the root causes, then people won't commit crimes anymore. So that's the one response to the problem of the penitentiary system. The other response is, it costs 100000 to build the prison cell. It costs another 100000 to maintain the prisoner in the prison cell. And then they commit the crimes at an even greater rate and they turn out worse. So why not deal with it very quickly? <laughs> Bang. Old West style. Just shoot them. A bullet costs a buck. What, um, in both cases, what are we talking about here? We're talking about human nature. The reason you don't shoot the prisoner in the head for a crime is because it has to be proportionate. Even if it were a murder, you would say that there has to be a process there and the process is going to cost some time and money for sure as well. Although it ought to be a limited time and a quick process because the, the quick process, a quick uh, jury is part of good justice. But still, you want to do this because the prisoner bears the image of God. That's why. Even the, even the criminal ought to be treated humanely as somebody who bears the image of God. You, may, you can't just shoot him in the head. Otherwise, why even wait for the prison? Why wait for the process? Just bang. Lots of vigilante movies out there right now. They do exactly that. The dirty Harrys of the world, right? They take, or the Batmans, 
I'm not going to go into the criminal justice system. I'm just going to go up and beat the, I'm going to go out and take care of the crime problem myself. I'm going to go outside the law, be the dark knight, right? That's okay. Uh, on the other hand, the person that was murdered also bears the image of God. And the injustice of putting them in the penitentiary system is rank, which you talked about. So in both, and, and the reason why we didn't treat the person with justice who committed the crime to begin with is because, again, we are the heirs of the romantics and we think that we are sinners because we sin. But don't acknowledge that the reason we sin is because we're sinners. So we don't see the root cause of the problem as sin. That's the root cause of the problem. And it's sin done by people who bear the image of God. So we have to acknowledge both of those realities in the treatment of crime and justice. Those two things. Even the criminals bear the image of God, and their victims do, but they do it because of sin. So sin is the problem, not society. The romantics blame it all on society. They always blame it on society. Faulty view of human nature. They have an Aryan Christology. They also will uh, believe that um, people are basically good. I think everybody in Canada thinks that people are basically good, including most Christians. Oh, they meant well. So my baby, when he punched me in the face because he was angry, I've seen babies punch their moms in the nose, and mom sort of shocked and laughs. You know, he doesn't know how to express himself. Yeah, he, got, I, he did. He was red-faced, and he popped you right in, the, <laughs> right in the nose. And if he were bigger, you wouldn't be laughing. And why? Be, it's because he has a sin nature. That's why. You didn't need to be taught it. You just, you upset him. You had a piece of cake. He wanted the cake. He was looking at the cake. You ate the cake, and he went, I wanted that cake. Right? That, that's, anyone who has a child learns ori that original sin is in the children long before society gets them. But the romantics deny it, and our whole society is built on the romantics worldview about the nature of sin. And the result of that, ironically, is through the politics of pity and guilt, and guilt being we should feel badly because the criminals have acted this way, we end up in 1984 to try and prevent the crimes from, from ever happening, which makes a, the problem infinitely worse. But all this comes from a false view of human nature, which emerges in the 18th century and, and gets picked up. And over the course of time, it becomes institutionalized and is taught in the universities as a true portrait of what human beings are like and how to treat it. And you will find it e even in this institution, we are corrupted by these anti-biblical worldviews. I guarantee it, and in the seminaries, I guarantee it, and in your churches, you will not, you will not hear what I just said to you. And everyone will agree with point one, including me, but will everyone agree with point two? That's where the rubber hits the road. One, you could be a Christian, two, you are a Christian. or you admit something necessary to becoming a Christian, that you have to admit that you're a sinner and that there is a savior who came to remedy the problem of human sin because you couldn't do it because you're a sinner, right? So, and you needed to be saved from the wrath of God. Anyway, so in this, does that answer your question in any way? Am I going in the right direction? Okay, good. So when it says that war is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. We have got to a society, you know, we talked about Ecclesiastes here, and the problem that because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. So it's not just that it's speed, it's not justly applied either. There, it's, it, the justice isn't enough, so people are angry. There's no measure for measure. So what ensues? Romans 1 is what ensues. 
not Romans 12. That ensues as well, but that's not what I'm talking about here. The exchanges. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. They suppress the truth and unrighteousness. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. His invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. In the things that have been made, you can see the hand of God and everyone knows it. And if they say they don't see it, they are lying. They're lying. And because of that, and did not honor God or give thanks to them, they became futile in their thinking and the, their foolish hearts were darkened. And claiming to be wise, they became fools. And then there's an exchange that happens and a degeneration. So Orwell, Huxley's Brave New World, where they deny that sexual activity has any moral considerations, leads to an injustice being done, and that degenerates further downhill, and eventually leads to the scenario of 1984. People who say they don't care about theology uh, are very foolish. They have a theology, it's just bad theology. And the remedy of bad theology isn't no theology, it's good theology. Yes? Like, would, would it be fair to say that, like, with the two views, like, in Brave New World and 1984, that almost always, like, the carrot comes first and then the boot comes and then the carrot no longer works? <laughs> or is there ever, like, a reversal of the two? So they're two competing visions. They don't try and blend them. Uh, in, so I, I, I'm moving from comments about the novel to comments about human nature in general to comments about how we got here from the Romantics legacy to comments about the current world. And let's acknowledge it for within the context of the novels, they see them, they separate the two. And I think for the sake of uh, artistic merit, it works well to have them separated in many ways. So you're like in, in, like real life. in real life. Yeah. In real life, as I say, there's not a lot of uh, distinction between them. They have the same faulty view of human nature, which allows any consequence. And the, con the consequences of slavery, the people who are in these uh, novels, whether Brave New World or 1984, are being treated as prisoners slash slaves. One is very happy to be a prisoner. What? I get as much as I want in accordance with the way I've been hatched. I get to do things that I enjoy with people that I like, and I get to have sex on demand, and I get that Soma thing, whatever that is, that's maybe like Viagra. I, I have no idea what it is, but it, it makes them very happy. And you, So are they slaves? Yes, they're slaves to the people that are giving them this. They don't have any moral free will of, in, of any sort. They're just happy slaves. Here we have unhappy slaves, but they're still both slaves being conditioned. And then the question is, do the conditioners regard any common ground between them and their prisoners? And in both cases, the answer is no. We see that the, the elites that are con doing the conditionings live a different life. They don't even buy what they're doing, to, in, in, even in Brave New World. No, it's... Yeah, it's the system, I benefit from it, and it, yeah, it's, I have challenges with it, of course, but you know, I, I'm doing better, and, and I, I'm, I'm not living in that world myself, I'm above it. In 1984, they have as much contempt for the prisoners, but it's added to with a little bit of sadism. Yeah, they're human bugs, and I'm going to stamp on their face and why should I not there is no common ground between me and them that's the truth in both cases. the conditioners regard the entities that we see them as people but that from their perspective these are not of the same type as they are a totally different type 
And that's because they don't see a common moral nature. They don't have a God. They don't bear the image of God, all of them. That has been thrown away. Now, both novelists, they're not Christian novelists. They're not doing what I'm doing with, in my explanation of the novel, which is to suggest that behind this whole portrait is a defective theology that explains what comes about here, and they can't come up with a solution for it. They don't see as clearly as they could what the problem with this is, but they are very clear in their depiction of it, and everybody recognizes the totalitarian uh, and inhumane consequences of totalitarianism. We all recognize that, and everyone says, this is very realistic, isn't it? And under COVID, people were en masse buying copies of 1984. I wonder why that is. Suddenly, 1984 became popular. Isn't that interesting? And why would they do that? <laughs> and then say that Mr. Orwell is prophetic and Mr. They, they, didn't, they weren't reading Brave New World. That wasn't very popular at that time. Because they were being treated like Winston Smith and not like the characters in Brave New World. But I think they're, uh, they're very similar. Anyway, Winston is reading the slogans of the party and seeing the Ministry of Truth. Now, the Ministry of Truth is the Ministry of Propaganda. Everything in this world is flipped upside down in that sense. The Ministry of Love is the Ministry of Punishment. It's a prison. It's, when I say punishment, it's not just a prison. You go there to be tortured, which doesn't happen in most prisons or it's not supposed to. And the reference to the Victory Mansions, uh, and, and here are the other ministries. So the Ministry of Truth, which concerned itself with news, entertainment, education, and the fine arts. Question, in the Ministry of Truth in our day, we don't have a government department for the Ministry of Truth, but we do have government control over news, entertainment, education, and the fine arts. Why would the government be interested in these realms? What, what would, why would politicians be interested in having political control over those diverse areas? The Ministry of Peace, which concerned itself with war. The Ministry of Love, which was law and order. And the Ministry of Plenty, which was responsible for economic affairs. And in news speak, many true, many packs, many love and many plenty. Sort of love it. News speak, they come up with new words that are abbreviations of contradictions. And then people start speaking in jargon. You'll know that academics do this all the time. They use jargon, a sort of special vocabulary, and they don't care that you don't know what they're talking about, pretty much. And in some fields, they will do it with acronyms as well, like, like the ABD of a MBA or of a PhD. I'm, I'm ABD in my PhD. Do you know what ABD of, in a PhD is? ABD is your all but disser dissertation. So you've done your, but in the academic field, you're going to say, oh, I'm ABD in my PhD. Everyone else is like, huh? <laughs> That happens in business and so forth, abbreviations. And, they, it start, and it's nonsensical unless you're, you're in the in crowd that you just don't want to have to say. So it's, it's a quicker way of saying things. You can add that almost infinitely. And that's what we have here. But it is decidedly menacing. There's no, there's no attempt to hide the menace, whereas in uh, Brave New World, there is no menace, or so it appears. And note that when he turns around, he had set his features into the expression of quiet optimism, which it was advisable to wear when facing the telescreen. So he knows how to act and when to act, because he knows where the, the cameras are. 
his problem is going to come when he goes into a place where he doesn't know where the cameras are, where the recording devices are, and is caught. Because he goes to a place where he doesn't think that such things exist, which is like a trap for people like him, because anyone who really was compliant wouldn't even go to those places. Those are there to catch the flies, of which Winston Smith is one. It's a little honey trap. Anyway, he gets victory gen, and it's, <laughs> it's, it's not gin. Uh, it's made like Chinese rice or victory cigarettes which are terrible, etc. We get a very quick portrait, and I think that's uh, Orwell is very, very good at painting a picture in a way that we don't. And, and, and so we move in the novel here. I mean, compare and contrast this to Heart of Darkness. Very visual, and yet in Heart of Darkness, there's a disorienting effect and a lack of clarity. Things blend together and blur together, and you're not quite certain where you ought to be in terms of your association with the protagonist. Are we with Marlowe? Do we, is he the good character? Like, who's the hero here? It's Marlo, Marlo, we're following Marlo, and then Marlo makes comments about Kurtz, and he makes comments about the inhabitants of the Congo, which are pejorative, and he makes comments, and others make comments about him, and we're just disoriented. We think, wh who is the good guy in this? And the answer is, there is no good guy. Here, we have the sense that there is a good guy, and Winston is the good guy. Right, so we're on Winston's side. And because of that, the, the oppression around him seems to oppress us. So we're siding with him. He's the hero. Whatever is, for all, for all of his flaws, we sense a fellow human being and we have compassion for him. Because we can imagine ourselves in the same situation. In fact, we might be in the same situation. Under COVID, we were in a similar sort of situation. Um, uh, that we think is oppressive and we want him to, we think that his uh, rebellion against it is legitimate and we want him to succeed. And we're hopeful, at least I was when I started reading it, that he would find other people and there, was, there would be enough residual hostility or at least questioning of the narrative of the world around them that they could band together and somehow overthrow the oppression. That was my hope in the novel. And when he meets this young woman who passes him a note, he's th and you think, oh, another person like him. And then he meets another person. And then there's this O'Brien figure. And all of these are ho little, little signs of hope that maybe something might be possible to escape the Presidio, Moderna, the all-seeing prison cell that he's in. He writes a note. It's April 4th, 1984. He sought back a sense of complete helplessness had descended upon him. To begin with, he did not know with any certainty that it, this was 1984. So there's a very fixed scene externally. Externally, we see everything around us with great clarity because Orwell paints it very clearly. But in terms of the internal world of the uh, protagonist, Winston Smith, there's cloudiness, there's uncertainty. He's not sure about his own past even. He's not sure of the time. He's not sure he can even trust his own judgment. And the reason why is everything around him contradicts his judgment. And everyone acts in accordance with a reality that he doesn't think is true, but they act as if it is. And so he, does, he actually loses a sense of stability in this. Now, this is a culture that has been forced into amnesia coerced into amnesia, it forgets itself. Oh, let me say something about this as well. You know the effect of amnesia, right? You know what amnesia is? You lose your memory? You can lose your memory, get a bump on the head, whatever, forget who you are. And you would probably feel for the victim who st was struck his head and couldn't remember who he was. Terrible state of affairs, must be terrifying 
people say, oh, hi, and you don't know, you have no idea who they are. Somebody speaks to you and they're friendly, oh, hi. Somebody speaks to you and they're very angry. And you think, what did I do? And the answer is you did nothing, but you, you, the you who they can see must have done something that person that you don't even remember exists. I must have done something. So a woman is very angry at me. Oh my goodness, what did I do to her? This woman is very pleasant towards me. Oh, what did I do to her? Oh, she says she's my wife. I have no memory of you. These kids say that they're my, these little ones say that they're my children. I have no memory of you. Nightmare scenario. Here's the problem in that situation. In both cases, the person who has lost their memory and who has no sense of personal history and is thus like an orphan, no parents, or children. we have no idea what this person is going to do. And neither does this person. They have no ma past memories or relationships with people that will guide them into how they're to act presently towards the children and, let's say, their wife. They have nothing there. They have no sense of attachment, relationships. What if they see another woman and say, I like her better than the woman that says it's my wife? She says she's my wife. I have no memory of this. I don't even like her. Because she's still quarreling with me because I used to be a real jerk. But I don't even remember that. And she's being cruel to me. But she says she's my But I don't, I don't have enough of her. I'll, this person who has no memory, the amnesiac, can literally do anything. Totally unpredictable. Everyone around the amnesiac is as threatened by the loss of personal memory as the person who suffers from the lack of personal memory. Everybody is threatened by this. Question, a, I wrote the little theological thing there. One final little picture. I'm an incredible artist. What is this I'm drawing here? Thank you. I hope. Sailboat. Okay, what's this? Anyone? Anyone? Uh, uh, no. But close. What's, what's underneath the water? The rudder is this thing that you steer it with, like the sail, the... Is the rudder attached to Yeah, which is what? It's the keel. What does a keel allow you to do? You know what the sail does. The sail catches the wind, it blows you. What happens if, you, if the keel drops out the bottom? Because it can drop out the bottom, like if you, you know this from sailing, right? The keel can drop right through, and if you capsize, it, it, I just knocks you over. This can go up through here and go to the bottom of the lake. And if you lose the keel, then it's, you know, you got to go down and get it because it's, it's not attached to the boat. It's just stuck in there. What does the keel allow you to do? It keeps it upright. Yeah. Because the wind, a gust of wind, without a keel, it just knocks it over. First gust of wind, boom, you go right over. Enough force, that thing underneath, deep under the water, actually keeps you and allows the, you from going over. The other thing that you can do with the rudder is you can tack against the breeze. You can actually use the wind by puffing the sails and putting out the right sails, and you can actually tack and you can go, even though the wind's blowing this way, you can actually go in the opposite direction. Not with huge speed, I mean, you need the breeze to blow, but very cleverly you can actually, uh, enough momentum to move in that direction. The, the keel will allow you to do that. Now a church without a keel can never go against the prevailing winds of its day. 
And the keel is the theology that it has under the water, the things that you don't see that undergird its practices. The theology is the keel of the boat. And a church without a keel is going to go along with the culture, and it's still going to call itself a boat, and still say that we're here for salvation, but they never go against the culture, because the culture, they think, is the voice of God, or the voice of the people. Uh, it was Hegel that said, Vox Populi Vox Deo. Whatever the social opinion of the day is, the voice of the people is the voice of God. If you got no theology, then you're going to go along with the winds that are blowing, the prevailing winds. And even if you try and go against it, unless you have enough theology under the water to keep you upright, you are going to go over. You have to have a sense of the importance of the integrity of the person. To go against the culture. You have to have a sense of the importance of the family in theology. You have to have a sense of the importance of liberty and so forth. Everyone course, uh, uh, collapses under pressure when they have nothing that allows them to resist. Anyway, that's what's happening in 1984. There is no, there is no resistance there. There's no keel anywhere. But the church is as much in danger of this as we see in 1984. There is, there is no resistance unless they have strong theological foundations that are principles that allow them to push back and say the reason we hold to this view is because that is what reality is. God is ultimate reality and we live in accordance with ultimate reality and that's why we're going to go against the voice of the people. It's what the early Christians did when they refused to take a pinch of incense and say, uh, Caesar is Lord. They refused. Because there's only one God. And Caesar is not him. Uh, at any rate, in this novel, we see, oh, it wasn't one minutes of hate. My memory is defective. It was the two minutes hate. The two minutes hate. And he goes out there and sees a girl whom he passed in the quarters. He didn't know her name, but he knew that she worked in the fiction department. She was a bold-looking girl of about 27 with thick hair, a freckled face, a swift athletic movements, a narrow scarlet sash, emblem of the Junior Anti-Sex League. Was wound several times around the waist of her overalls just tightly enough to bring out the shapeliness of her hips. Winston had disliked her from the very first moment of seeing her. He knew the reason. Why does he dislike her? It was because of the atmosphere of hockey fields and cold baths and community hikes and general clean-mindedness which she managed to carry about her. He disliked nearly all women and especially the young and pretty ones. It was always the women, and above all the young ones, who were the most bigoted adherents of the party, the swallowers of slogans, the amateur spies, and nosers out of unorthodoxy. He doesn't dislike her because she's young and pretty. He dislikes her because she's a conformist. He hates the conformism. He wants to rebel in it. Now, the ways he's going to rebel against it is by being sexually promiscuous, which she is also open to, as it turns out. In fact, she initiates it to his surprise because remember, he's 39. He can't even walk up a flight of stairs. He's not a, he's not a picture <laughs> of masculine uh, virility or anything of the sort. He, he's an unimpressive man. And she is a beautiful young woman, apparently. But this one is more dangerous than most. How come? Because she looks at him. And the reason this terrifies him is he's worried, because she's paid attention to him, that she's going to turn him in. That's why. She particularly likes a conformist who is threatening his very life. And by looking at him, why would a young woman of this age look at him? 
that's his question. The idea even crossed his mind that she might be an agent of the thought police. That it was true was very unlikely. Still, he continued to feel particular uneasiness, which had fear mixed up in it as well as hostility whenever she was anywhere near him. And the other person is O'Brien. And we're going to meet O'Brien in the third part here of the novel. O'Brien is somebody that he likes right away. He feels sympathy towards for some reason. What we find out later on, I don't want to spoil it, but actually it's too late, is that O'Brien is watching him and has always been watching him. O'Brien's the great threat in the whole novel. And he's a member of the inner party and holder of some post so important and remote that Winston had only a dim idea of its nature. A momentary hush passed over the group of people around the chairs as they saw the black overalls of an inner party member approaching. Now, compare that to Brave New World, you have different casts, but there's no sense of ominous threat. Whereas here, the differentiation comes through costume and it always carries with it a sense of malevolence and threat. And he seemed curiously civilized. And this draws Winston to him, probably because of residual memories of the world the way it used to be before 1984. There used to be men who were older who would wear spectacles on his nose in a way that would make you trust them because they were older, they would read things, they were patient, they were kind, and he probably reminds him a bit of that. He's older than Winston Smith. And he felt deeply drawn to him. So study in contrast, Julia, whom he has not yet named, who he meets, he loathes, can't stand her. O'Brien the, is the exact opposite. He feels deeply drawn to him. And not solely because he's intrigued by the contrast between his na urbane manner and his prize fighter's physique, but much more it was because of a secretly held belief, or perhaps not even a belief, merely a hope that O'Brien's political orthodoxy was not perfect. In other words, he was a nonconformist like him. He hopes, he, there's no reason why he should hope this, but he's desperate, like a rat in a ship that's going down that maybe he might escape. And O'Brien might be the way to do it because O'Brien is in the inner sanctum and he sees him as an ally, even though we find out he's actually his biggest problem. And it suggests this. And what suggests it most of all is intelligence. He trusts intelligence. Very old school. Very normy. Now, the two minutes of hate begins, and then we meet the figure of Emmanuel Goldstein. Now, who is this? The enemy of the people. And at that point in the two minutes of hate, they pour their enmity out on Goldstein. They're hissing, they're screaming. If you want to see film versions of this, there was one produced in 1984. John Hurt, I can't remember the girl who was in it, um, but uh, John Hurt's a good actor. Uh, I haven't actually seen the film, but I remember seeing the uh, clips from it. Um, there were hisses here and there among the audience. The little sandy-haired woman gave a squeak of mingled fear and disgust, Goldstein was a renegade and backslider who once long ago, how long ago, nobody quite remembered, had been one of the leading figures of the party, almost on a level with Big Brother himself. Big Brother is a person, as I say, probably modeled after Stalin. But now he's an unperson. He's been, he's been scrubbed out of history. He's been made an unperson. Uh, and at this point, he is being condemned to death, and somehow he's got away. And these are there in, in order to uh, point to treachery in general. So to keep people aware of the possibility of betrayal and the hatred and vindictiveness that the party will execute on the people that are opposed to it, because the party is for the people. Big Brother is, he's got your back. He's with you. And if you're not with him, then he's going to throw you under the bus, of course. But he's a really a nice guy. And he's watching you. Or even if he isn't a nice guy, 
you better go along with him. Now, all subsequent crimes against the party, all treacheries, all acts of sabotage, whatever, spring directly from Goldstein's teaching. And of course, Winston goes along with this because he's not stupid. So he screams at the screen as well. Everybody's screaming at the, at the screen because they're being watched. In North Korea, they will do this as well, by the way, to this day. So if you don't act upon command sufficiently angrily or you're weeping, by the way, they all weep at once when the dear leader comes out. They're all in tears and laughing with a hysterically. They've been conditioned uh, because cameras will capture the footage and see the per people in the crowd that are not getting worked up enough. And they'll be punished for it, so they act accordingly. Now, when they're off camera, out of sight, then they can do something different. But here, there is no out of sight. And if you act in accordance to a certain pattern, you get conditioned, and it's hard to leave that pattern at that point. Oops. It's hard to leave that pattern of conduct. If you do something every day, all the time, even if you're going through the motions, eventually, the role you're playing becomes you. That's the effect, the insidious effect of conditioning. Even if you don't believe it, you, you have the muscle memory and the intellectual memory, and then you, after a while, can't remember what you actually really think. This is the effect of lying as well, by the way. Lying degrades the person who's telling the lie, as well as tricking the people who are hearing the lie. If you lie enough, you don't remember when you were lying and when you were telling the truth. You don't even remember. People who you're lying to can remember. You lied to me there. They may not even remember it because they're so, they, they, part of the plausibility of a liar is to make themselves appear like they're telling the truth. If you act really well, then you become the liar that you are pretending to be. And that's what's happening in the whole society here. So people are losing their identity losing their own memory of themselves, and O'Brien is one. There's just a little bit of the old O'Brien that's holding on here that we want to survive this crushing brave new world. And we have some sense in books one and two, in particular when we come up to book two, that he's going to succeed. Because he and Julia get away. They find a little love nest. They escape into areas where there are no cameras a little bit of freedom, and we think they're going to succeed in this. There's a sense of increasing freedom, and as they, the freedom increases, the sense of optimism rises with it in the novel. That's, that's what happens, and it happens only basically to tease us into thinking it's like a cat with a mouse. The mouse thinks it's getting away, and then the cat goes. I have a cat at home, caught a mouse. That's exactly what they do. They let the, let the mouse up, the mouse starts, it goes squeak, 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 and then it he taps it again, it squeaks again, it's, it's awful to watch. And fascinating at the same time. And then it, and then it lets it get away, lets it run, and it's, but it, there's no way it's getting away. And then it just, again, and then you let it go, and again, you think, what? My little cat is a sadistic brute. <laughs> but that's what's going on here. There's a sadism in Big Brother, which we might say is unrealistic, because we think that human beings are basically good, but I think that we are deceived in this, and I think that Orwell is right, and that he's as realistic as Huxley is in this. Because in both cases, the two men regard human nature to be so depraved that these things are plausible, and with technology, they will be done on a totalitarian scale. Both men agree on that, but, they, but both men do not come to the conclusion that I did, the problem is sin. They don't come to that conclusion. We can come to that conclusion. But that's a different matter. Anyway, I'll leave you off with that because I think we're fini.